You're listening to The Upland Rookie, a podcast presented by Onyx Hunt, Final Rise, and a Nook Shook Professional Dog Food. And you're listening to episode 86, part one of my conversation with Robert Poor from Borderland Upland. Buckle up, it's going to be a good one. And this podcast is also presented to you by OnX Hunt, the most comprehensive public and private land ownership data mapping tool in the world. Many tools and layers like crop types, tree species, waypoints, and so much more. Uh, The Onyx Elite membership is going to give you a ton of access to um, a whole bunch of benefits, uh, discounts on awesome gear. Um, If you're not using Onyx Hunt already, I highly encourage you get over to onyxhunt.com and sign up today. And be sure to check out a Nook Shook Professional Dog Food, the only sporting dog, high-performance dog food I'm feeding my string of dogs. Have been using this for several years, and a Nook Shook has delivered and lived up to and surpassed all the hype you've been hearing about online, through friends, kennels, breeders, all that. And it has just been a high-quality premium food. Uh, I've been able to cut back several cups of food for my dogs, still keeping weight on them, during season, during trialing, whatever it might be, these dogs are in best shape they've been in personally in a long, long time. And thanks to Anook Shook Professional Dog Food, they have four incredible formulas. Check them out at anookshookpro.com. And last but not least, Final Rise Gear. I am so pumped and proud to be representing the Final Rise brand. They have been producing year after year quality premium upland gear that has made for the hunter, the bird hunter who is putting on miles after miles, season after season, and wants gear to hold up to the elements of how you are hunting. You gotta look no further than finalrise.com. Check out the Summit Vest, the Summit XT Vest, which is brand new, the Sidekick Vest, as well as the Legacy. So many vest options, which are totally customizable. Um, I'm pretty darn confident you're gonna find something that works for you and your setup. Uh, So check them out at finalrise.com. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Upland Rookie Podcast. I hope you're ready for an episode today. we got a two-parter with Robert Poor. And if you're wondering, hey, that name sounds familiar, you may follow him on Instagram, Borderland Upland. Uh, This is, to my knowledge, I think I did confirm with Robert as well. I think. I'm going to go out on a limb there and say this is the first time he's been on a bird hunting podcast. So I'm very excited, very thankful that he was able to uh, take some time um, from his schedule, training, his life, his job, all that stuff to sit down with me um, and do a podcast together. So uh, Super fun uh, being able to get to know Robert a little bit more. Um, we'll dive into more of who he is in our interview. So uh, get ready. Uh, this is part one and part two will drop in a couple days. Hey, I'm going to keep this intro kind of short. I know I say that quite a bit. Um, I hope First off, everyone's doing well. I um, hope you enjoyed the series I did with Todd Agnew from uh, the Spaniel Training. Uh, that was a super fun episode. I really enjoyed chatting with him, uh, chatting Spaniels, trials, all that good stuff. Um, obviously, we chat a lot of pointing dogs, which I love. I'm super passionate about. Um, but chatting with with Todd a couple weeks ago, um, super fun. Got my head kind of spinning around uh, Springers. And we, we obviously talked about the Cocker more. Uh, and we talked about the Cocker again on today's episode with Robert. Um, or it might be on part two actually, but and regardless, we, we chat about the cocker, which is kind of taking over the, the world by storm. Uh, but we kind of talk about the, the practical uses for a cocker. Um, so if you haven't listened to the episode with Todd, I'd highly recommend, uh, go back, check out that episode, whether you're, uh, want to learn more about the cocker spaniel, the Springer spaniel. Uh, those are kind of the two we cover mostly. Uh, I thought that was a really fun, fun conversation. So, um, we are in, gosh, we're almost end of May here almost end of May. Life has been flying by right now. Um, I have been quiet on social media. I know. I'm very sorry for that. I've gotten my DM inbox is full right now. Uh, I'm very sorry. (laughs) I kind of just, life is kind of just taking over right now with some other uh, priorities right now. So I have not been super active on social media. Apologies for that. I'll try to ramp that up as we head into summer, head into fall, of course. Um, But we're rocking and rolling here with the podcast. Um, 
And I wanted to let you know, uh, we have the Gunner giveaway happening. Uh, I finally have a date announced that I can talk about the Gunner giveaway for the Fan Kit 2.0. So who doesn't love free gear? Um, so for Patreon members only, you got to be signed up on Patreon. You can become any level of support over at patreon.com slash the Upland Rookie Podcast. Uh, I'm going to announce the winner on May 31st. It's Wednesday, May 31st. I will announce the winner of the Gunner Fan Kit 2.0. Uh, you can attach that to any uh, kennel you have. Um, of course, it's going to attach really, really nicely to a Gunner kennel. Um, so you're going to get a brand new fan kit as well as an Upland Rookie hat, a couple stickers. So head over to patreon.com and get signed up as a supporter today. Greatly, greatly appreciate all of those who are signed up on Patreon right now. Thank you for your support of the podcast. Um, every every penny over there goes back into the podcast, um, helping support the show, hosting fees, um, all sorts of stuff. I am going to be working on a website here pretty soon. Um, Got to get with my brother on that. He, he promised me a website uh, for the price of a Yeti cooler. So I think I can make that happen for him. Um, Dan, if you're listening, which I know you're not, <laughs> I'm going to be, be talking to you very soon about getting the website up and rolling. So um, anyways, guys, again, like I said, I think this is Robert's first podcast appearance. I'm super thankful that uh, he was able to make that happen uh, for our listeners. Um, again, you may know him for uh, some of his <laughs> some of his Upland memes. Uh, his content is actually really, really good. Um, I love Robert's pretty authentic approach, honestly, kind of no BS attitude, um, just to how he approaches social media, um, which we do talk about on part two. Um, we kind of just unpack of, of the good and the bad of social media and how it relates to the bird hunting world and, and all that stuff. So we, we dive into that more, but, um, I really appreciate Robert been chatting with him for, for, I mean, probably a couple years now, just getting to know him a little bit more. I love seeing his passion, um, and, and his humor as well. Um, just again, we all have our own take on, um, on hunting. I, I love, I, I can appreciate uh, different styles, different, um, yeah. So I, I, I really enjoy this conversation. I hope you guys do as well. Uh, without further ado, we're going to dive into part one with Robert Poor. You good, uh, good schedule as far as that's days on. Why, off. That's, that's why I'm in it. And that, that was about the only thing they would take a, a redneck with no education or experience in when I was super, super. Young, so. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's a good, that, I, I, I get the, uh, uh, Go ahead. Uh, no, no, was, go ahead. Uh, I did the wildland stuff for about 15 years and then uh, jumped over to structural a few years ago just to kind of um, see something different and uh, yeah. get a little closer to kind of a deal. Yeah, yeah. How was the wildland stuff? I love that... it, man. The, the, yeah. entire, the entire rest of being in your office is, is kind of a cool deal. <laughs> uh, tons and tons and tons of traveling. Um, 90% of the job was outdoors, not at a desk. It was, it was a really, really nice deal. That's cool. Yeah. That's really Took me cool. to a lot of places that you kind of keep in, in the catalog. Oh, sure. For, uh, maybe, uh, set and sail with the truck and some bird dogs. Yeah. <laughs> drop, drop, pull out your Onyx real quick and <laughs> drop a pin. Yeah. A lot of this, a lot of this was pre Onyx, but you're thinking about it. You're like, uh, cause like, you know, I did a fought fire in like Hell's Canyon and the old okay. he breaks and legendary bird country and you're out there in july and you're watching waves of chuckers get up and you're like i'll be back one day i'll be back <laughs> with with a wildland firefighter are you really you're not really tied to a state right you could be sent anywhere when there's wildfire well it, it kind of depends on what you're assigned to like if you're assigned to a interagency hotshot crew that's a national resource you can go anywhere okay. um i was on an engine and did some hand crew stuff off and on um, the majority of my career and during our core fire season, you're, you're, you're where you need to be. You're here. Mm. But like, uh, for us, our, our monsoon season that drives a lot of our, you know, Mern's quail hatch, it makes it to where nothing will burn. Mm. So, uh, with that being said, you could sit there with, uh, and twiddle your thumbs or you can go where other places are burning and it kind of burns latitudinally. So like Arizona kicks off first and then mm. Utah and Colorado and uh, then like okay. roll. Washington, Oregon, that kind of a thing. So you just kind of work your way slowly north throughout the season, August, wow. September. Usually come home about October first, that kind of okay. thing. Okay, interesting. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, before I was gonna, uh, before I was a pastor, I thought I wanted to be a firefighter. I, I did want to be a firefighter, and then uh, I was working at church part time, and then they approached me about a full time role, and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> want to be a pastor? <laughs> okay, that's awesome. But that's I was, good. I know. 
I know it's a, it, it's been fun, but um, there the, every time I see a fire fire truck still, I'm like, oh, that was my that was my love. <laughs> that was my. I, I was big grown up that had no interest in it, but when I was in college, and they're like, hey, do you want to uh, like go s- dig and stir in the dirt and put fires out and <laughs> see the western public lands, and we'll pay you? I was like, yeah, that, that seems like something I could get on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Where do I sign? Where do yeah. I sign? And, Early on in your career, like before you get picked up, picked up, it's seasonal work. So it worked really good with like a, a school schedule for like oh sure college students. A lot of, I would say a decent majority are wildland firefighters uh, are college students and they just do it seasonally. Okay. And, um, once you kind of move on and progress and get picked up and that kind of thing, it just kind of turns into a full-time job. But it's kind of like, I'd imagine being a junkie, they give you a little bit at sure, first. Yeah. And <laughs> you a get a little bit more. You get a taste of it. Can you? <laughs> on it and I've got a full-time job. Where the hell did yeah. this happen? <laughs> right. You're like, how did this, yeah, how did this happen? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, turn in, turn into the, uh, the bird dog side of things here, Robert. Um, yeah. fr- fresh off the old gram here, you know, a couple weeks ago, we finished up with, uh, with the bird dog bracket. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I'm sure you did. I, did. I, I know I you did. did Cause we, we chatted a little bit. Um, give me your, uh, give me your, your reaction to the, the bird dog bracket, um, well, over the last couple weeks. I'm not so certain that it was a bird dog bracket. Uh, that's that's no jab at, at bird dog of the day, the folks that put it on. I think it was largely a pet bracket <laughs> popularity contest. <laughs> not to say that Britneys and short hairs aren't awesome, but boy, oh boy, there is a lot of uh, fur mommies voting on that. <laughs> For lack of a better phrase. Uh, yeah, of, I get it. A lot, a lot of running partner votes as opposed to bird dog votes. <laughs> and... Um, I, 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 it was, it was shaky. I understand what they're trying to do. It was cool. It was cool to see that level of involvement, sure. but you're scratching your head on like some of the pair ups and you're like, man, how the hell did that win? Have they never, <laughs> there was really a couple head scratchers. Yeah. Have you ever like never seen these dogs actually work at all? Right. But, um, I think, like, I think the obvious one, the, the pointer, what was the first, cause they went out in the first round, wasn't it? Who'd they get beat by? Do I don't, I don't even off the top of my head. I've tried to build some scar tissue around <laughs> get that. So, um, like I could see, like, if I, if I, if you were just going like, you know, probably ownership and popularity, like the matchup in my head was always lab, short hair, lab, sure. short hair, lab, short hair. And I don't have any of those. So I don't even have a dog in that fight. Sure. But, um, to me, like everybody's got a short hair or a lab. Everybody's got a short hair or a lab. I've had short hairs and labs both don't have any anymore but that was kind of the matchup and then like britney's just out of nowhere out of, yeah it surprised me big time kind of murderer's road knocking off all sorts of breeds yeah. it was kind of kind of surprising and even uh i was i did have a little bit dog in the fight in round one because they they used uh the picture of my cocker up against a boykin oh and, uh man the cockers got knocked off by boykins i was like that, that's a little that surprising, is surprising. Too. That is surprising yeah. because, because I mean, the, the cocker craze right now and just, I, I thought that they were going to be an easy, you know. Oh, they're the cutest trend in upland hunting right sure. now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, the uh, old cocker. I'd like, I could see if there was like a giant waterfowler presence, like leaning hard on the Boykin and maybe there was more of than I expected. Sure. But you think like the waterfowlers, like the serious guys are running labs. Um, unless they've got like some weird nuance, like South Carolina, I can absolutely, that's the dog of the state. Sure. I can see you having Boykins. Absolutely. But, um, the majority of those folks are running some sort of a, a retriever. Right. And, um, that, that Boykin cult is, uh, they're strong. They are strong and deep. I was not expecting that. I, I know. That. So it, it was, it was interesting. And I like, I kept tuning back in just to watch the upsets because none of my dogs are popular. They all got booted out. Like, <laughs> Super early, so I just kept waiting to see the upset, and they yeah. just kept the hits kept rolling. Holy <laughs> it crap. just kept coming because the setter didn't even make it super far, which was no, which is no, I mean, for, like, for bird, true bird dogs like like that and the pointer, like those are freaking bird like, dogs, like uh, American field placements. And it's like, yeah, none of these even make it, none of them right. even make it. like it's it's setters, pointers, you know, yeah. look at the entire trialing world, it's going to be Britney, short hairs setters pointers right those are as, your, let, your top like four. talk like navda specifically and then you'll start getting in you know some poodle pointers have been doing really well lately sure obviously the draughts and the, the wire hairs all that good stuff they do well but like man there were some just really interesting upsets so. <laughs> there were there were it was that, it was that's fun a, that's that's my take on it but it was it was all in good fun and it was uh it was fun to fun to poke the britney crab hell i've had britney's i think 
a, a common misconception in my world is people think that I pick on breeds and I hate them. And I'm like, man, I've owned half of these. And they're <laughs> I get, that, that's even better that. when you I know, yeah. I know some nuance and I can pick on them maybe a little bit better. Sure. Maybe. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you about the, uh, the Griff later on and we'll, uh, we'll circle back to that. Cause you, you yeah, give yeah, some it good, was just, it was just their turn. <laughs> it's just they were up next in the uh in the alphabet yeah yeah oh uh, well robert before uh before we go too much further why don't you uh introduce yourself tell everyone uh who we're talking to and uh just give us a little overview maybe of, of who you are yep uh name's robert poor uh instagram handle borderland underscore upland um i i kind of i guess got pointed out for making memes um been running bird dogs the majority of my life been upland hunting the majority of my life i'm i'm in my late 30s now um everything kind of i i used to do a lot more big game um but everything's kind of moved towards the uh an upland upland centric world and that's kind of all i want to do i'm like doing everything i can to retire as early as i can and just do that Hmm. Uh, i'm in uh southeast arizona and uh largely chasing quail um but do a little bit of traveling bird hunting too that's awesome that's awesome yeah. man well i can't wait to uh unpack your story a little bit more i want to hear more about your journey uh you know with upland hunting and, and all sorts of stuff here um <laughs> but i know um you know not too long ago you had uh when your dogs uh get pretty sick and uh luke is that right how's yeah. uh how's luke doing why don't you give us an update on him and kind of maybe just a synopsis of kind of what was going down because there's a, a good reach here and because a lot of people travel to the Southwest this year, chasing quail, there was a, a interesting thing happened with him. Um, so he ended up picking up a, uh, inhaled foreign body. We're assuming a grass on. And then with that, a Valley fever infection, which is huge in the Southwest. Uh, it's a, a fungal infection. And my concern with that for the bird dog world is that you know, if you're from Minnesota and you bounced down here and hunted in this stuff and, and got exposed to that, your vets may not be able to recognize it. So being able to to pick up on, and, and the ugly truth about Valley fever is it can manifest dozens of ways. It can show up as bone cancer, lesions, coughs, all sorts of things. And so oh, wow. it's one of those nebulous things that- Th- Sorry, those are results of that? Val- those can be yeah. results of Valley fever? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, those, those are symptoms for it. And like wow. uh, my brother had a dog that they diagnosed with bone cancer and ended up in Valley fever and you put them on a fun- antifungal and life is great. Wow. It manifests a ton of different ways. So if people are traveling down here and their dogs are getting sick and there's no, they don't know what's happening, um, that's something to look at, especially for- people that are coming from a part of the world where that's not a common thing. It's big in Arizona, sure. Mexico and, and California, if I'm not mistaken. But so he was fighting two infections. The odd deal was, is I hunted him, had no idea, no inclination. He was sick. He was eating good, everything like that. I hunted him. And because he's a pup, I've been hunting him by himself a lot, trying to make him an independent bird finder on his own, rather than being steered into birds by more experienced dogs. I do mix that in a little bit just to get his face in some birds, but more just wanting to create an independent, absolute bird frenzied bird finder and so he pointed three species of quail that day we had a really really good day Uh, i missed his merns quail unfortunately and end of the day he stabbed a giant covey of scale quail wave went up shot a bird he went over like he knew what i was doing picked it up i'm super proud i let him pack it around a little bit loaded him in the truck drove home and when i went to unload him he was stoved up sickly didn't want to eat at all and uh i usually feed right after hunting when i got home and So myself and my wife determined that he wasn't doing good. Uh, She used to work at a vet clinic and I've had animals all my life. And so we blasted off an hour to an emergency vet in Tucson. And about halfway there, he went unresponsive on me. Unresponsive pain and everything. We all know how like tender dog's ears are or anything like that. I could grab a ball of his ear up and Mm. he wouldn't even wince and flinch or anything. I was raking his ribs to try to get him to lift his head just to try to keep some level of consciousness there. And sure they got him in uh, Valley fever test later. They ended up finding out that he had a pneumothorax. So he had a collapsed lung on one side as well as a pyothorax, which is a a pus buildup probably from that on. Okay. I did probably exited his lung and combination of factors there between the Valley fever infection and the on, he had a deflated lung and a, and a pretty gnarly oh, cold infection. Sorry, real quick. Do you, the grass on, do they think that was, is it quick? Like he might've inhaled that 
on that hunt or like he could days or weeks that, prior. It's, it's so nebulous with those things. He could have had that grass on in there for a while. And then it just started migrating and exited the lung or something like that. And they never okay. came up with the on itself, which talking with uh, a couple of docs that literally wrote the paper on grass on infections, they're like, most of the time you don't come up with it. It's just a, hmm. a most likely scenario. Okay. But, um, with that, he's, he's doing good now. Um, he's, he's on a heavy course of antibiotics for, about four months from the onset well, wow. uh, and a heavy course of an antifungal for about six months from the onset. And, uh, the, the goal is, is if we stop and it gets reestablished, now we have a more, um, resistant infection. So we have to, mm. we have to treat it as overkill is the rule moderations for cowards, kind of an approach. Okay. And, and, uh, the Valley fever test, they, they, they can check tighter counts and we'll be doing that about every six months, probably for the rest of his life. And he's just, over wow. He's probably about a year and a half right now. So okay, okay. We got Jeez. a long road ahead, but he's he's up. Yeah. And around. We're kind of restricted movement and that kind of a thing, but he's he's doing good and he has no idea he's sick. So sure, we're just, <laughs> he's a, we're just he's a pop still. He's, he's a he's a big happy dopey setter. So <laughs> that's crazy, man. What a what a, a journey there with him, and and obviously pretty scary. Man, and, it's always something. I I I've, yeah. I've had my share of sick dogs. I had a uh, Brock a couple years ago with globoid cell leukodystrophy, which caused a seizure disorder. I had a Brittany back in the day with epilepsy. So I'm just kind of just yeah. kind of waiting for a, a normal damn dog. <laughs> uh, and even my cocker, my cocker is as healthy as the day is long, but he's suicidal. He just has no no idea of self preservation whatsoever so don't see is that, is that most cockers though or is that just is your special i don't know um i haven't been around a ton of them they're not a big thing down here in the southwest uh i bought actually got him from tyler sladen and that was the first okay. time i'd hunted over a cocker was his river dog and i had so much fun mm. and just hell on wheels on desert quail and so i was like ah, i gotta get me a little bit of that so uh, <laughs> he threw a litter i bought one of those and i just don't see a lot of them yeah on here but the ones i've seen are, are uh, pretty rambunctious <laughs> that's yeah, he, awesome well yeah, while we touch while we touch on the cocker and first off i'm glad luke's doing better and, yeah. and you know good luck on his the journey ahead again sounds like it's gonna be long but um just glad he's glad he's doing well um just touch on the cocker you got one i mean he's he's not how too old now right he's pretty he's, young still he's right there so uh I, I did some really poor planning um i had a deposit in with alder fork english setters for oh probably about 10 months before uh mm -hmm. Uh, ever bred and dropped a litter. And so that was just always kind of on the back burner of uh, the setter will come when the setter comes. And then Tyler made that litter announcement for the cockers. And I was like, ah, it's not going to line up that close. They ended up lining about two weeks apart. Ooh. Ended up with two puppies about two weeks, Ooh. maybe three weeks. And uh, so for a decent little stretch there, I wanted to suck start a revolver, but uh, <laughs> it was. Uh, so he's I'm sure. right there just older than the setter. He's, um, I want to say he's born in July. So coming up on, two, okay. Coming up on. Two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what's, what's that cocker experience like, especially like you, like you said, you're mostly hunting quail. Mm -hmm. Um, how, how would someone use a quail or use a quail, <laughs> use a cocker in a, in a quail hunting situation? How do you use your, your cocker? Well, I'm still kind of figuring that out a little bit. Um, so on desert quail, which are, uh, kind of notorious runners, um, gambles and scaly specifically, and to put it in context, the first time I had ever hunted pheasants was, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 years ago. And I finally started understanding how pheasants worked. And I was like, oh, these are a three and a half pound scaly. Okay. Cool. Mm. They like to run, whatever, all that good stuff. So, um, kind of using that same mindset and applying the cocker to desert quail. Um, if I, the whole goal is to keep him into gun range and he's going to root out any living creature at all. And it works okay. really, really well independently. Um, on desert quail. Now, if I pair them with pointers, what's amazing is that little booger will still find his own birds that we walk past. Hmm. And, um, like I, I hunt with some buddies, uh, filthy upland is his Instagram handle. Phil Wex. Oh, sure. He runs some really, really nice pointing dogs. Another, a buddy of ours, Eric Walters has one of the nicest Britneys I've ever seen. Hmm. And, um, what's crazy is that little dog behind all of those dogs will still root out singles here and there. And wow. just a, tenacious tenacious retriever and with desert quail being a lot like pheasants they're very very lively cripples and if they hit the ground and bolt they're liable to go in rodent holes cactus patches mm -hmm. stuff like that so having a tenacious little retriever there and phil he he marries his up with a lab he runs a really really nice upland lab 
and we can run those two dogs behind all of the pointers. The pointers out, you know, a couple hundred yards doing work, okay. heavies, that kind of a thing. And those flushers, 25, 30 yards in doing that work and doing a lot of our yeah and, and like you said they're still picking up their own birds that maybe the pointers still you know, have, their own have passed up or it's, it's the way i look at it is uh in in my little system here we've got some more powerful dogs that are doing you know three four hundred yard work and uh in the hound world would be like a strike dog so they're finding good cubbies that kind of a thing and then we've got some mid-range dogs that are a little bit more thorough like my brock um very very thorough uh, good nose on her. She's got a cannon for a nose. And then you've got the incredibly, incredibly coarse filter of that cocker at 25. Mm. Nothing's getting past that little bugger. That's awesome. Now on Merc. Do, do you, oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, no. uh, sorry. Um, just real quick. I think there's a little delay. Sorry, yeah, man. Sorry. Um, uh, with your cocker real quick, um, do you have any goals to get where, you know, there, the, the pointing dog points and then the cocker goes in to flush that I, for the pointer. I was just getting there. I'm glad you, Okay. Okay. So, cool. Uh, Mern's quail, with them being very, very behaved and and um, honoring good dog work, if a pointing dog stabs them, they're going to be there when you get there. And um, so originally, you know, within the spaniel world, hupping hupping a spaniel, getting them to sit, I was having to do that initially a lot. Um, so I'd have the little cocker working with me, and just because he's a lot of fun, and I brought him along, and I wanted to see how this kind of dynamic was going to work in Mern's quail. And come to find out that like I would walk in on point and he would see that dog on point and after hearing it and getting, you know, a little Edison medicine and talking to and hopping and that kind of a thing, he got to where he would see, and it's not a true back like a pointing dog would expect, but he would see my main opal dog on point and he'd park his butt. Or I'd be just talking to her, you know, trying to ease her because it might be, you know, five, 10 minutes walking across the canyon to get to, to that pointing dog on Mern's quail. And I just talk to her, hey, easy girl, you're doing good. Whoa, just super easy, you know, calming, calming words. And uh, as soon as he sees her and hears me say, whoa, he parks. And so wow. nice with that is I could get people set up in shooting lanes. Yeah. Um, because it's all about the cubby rise with Mern's Quail. If I could get people set up and in position and everybody back, traditionally, I have done the flushing. And now I can sit back, take pictures, smile, and <laughs> not worry about getting shot. Send in the coke the monkey with a switchblade and let him do the flight work <laughs> and the retrieving work. Because largely, my setter will retrieve. He doesn't care much for it. My brock will sure. retrieve too. It's okay. But that cocker, all he wants to do is bring you anything he can find. It's like a pet raccoon. He just he has to grab something up and bring it to you. So on the mer that sounds so fun. I, I, I would like to think that I sold some cockers this winter to people that hunt. I'd like to think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because it's just a, Get a little back. commission from the cocker society. Yeah. Everybody stands back and gets <laughs> in position. And then you send that little, you know, that little lawnmower in there and he gets the birds moving and you get shot angles that you just don't get hmm. with pointing dogs. And when we're flushing in front of pointing dogs, when we're flushing in front of pointing dogs, birds are going away from us. We're the threat. Hmm. When they see that little coked out monkey with a switchblade coming after him, I am not the threat anymore. You got birds whizzing past your head and all sorts of wow. angles that you've just never seen before. And it, yeah. largely it's safer. And I kind of stole that from, from my buddy, Phil, who's been doing that for years with his lab over putting dogs okay. on Mern's quail. And, uh, when I got him initially, it was, uh, because of, uh, a, a comment Maddie Rawlinson said, who runs some really, really nice cockers. It's that they're not a tool for every situation, but they're the perfect tool for some situations. So like, when I'm traveling, if you see that that old broke down homestead that's real weedy that might hold a few bob whites or maybe some huns or something like that, you can send out that cocker sure. and have a really fun 15, 20 minute little loop there. And I just yeah. kind of slowly started adopting him into what I do here. And it's been working really, really well. I just don't, it sounds stupid. We all lose a few birds here and there, but I just don't lose birds with that dog. He is a tenacious little retriever and he is hell on cripples. So. That is so cool. It, will he be able to uh, make, so, you know, he, say you knock down a couple buddies and yourself, knock down maybe two, three birds from a cubby mm -hmm. or whatever. Will he be able to then bring one back and then you'll send them out back on another, we're, so we're, I guess we call it maybe a blind retrieve? Yeah, or? exactly. So uh, we're not there yet. We started into it a little bit last year, uh, last year being his uh, puppy season. Um, so the my whole training work up through the summer and everything, we started working on that. And uh, a good friend of mine who actually has a lab from Phil, He's a waterfowl guide here, and he's got 
uh, essentially a master hunter class lab. And I was like, okay. better to train with to start doing the blinds and stuff with, with Bart. Because I do do a uh, lot of dove hunting with him. And, you know, we knock down two or three doves. Mm. I want to be able to stay sure. in our blind area, send him on a dove, get him back, line him back up and doing that. So we're going to start working on that um, probably here within the next month or so. Start doing full. Okay. Now, I want to take him to that level. I don't, I'm not yeah. testing him or putting any ribbons on him or anything like that. But sure. I would really, really like to be able to take him to that level for blind retrieves and marks and that kind of thing. Yeah, that sounds I, awesome, man. Well, that sounds like a fun experience. It's a ton of fun. Like you can't not smile when that little dog is zapping around. You just can't. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I hear. You're having that's what a bad I hear, day, you're just knocking holes in the sky. You just look at him, and it's like everything is okay. There's still <laughs> world. Everything is all. Right. So. Oh, cute little upland fairy yeah, dog. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, Robert, I'd love to uh, unpack your, uh, let's back things up a little bit. Um, what, you know, getting into upland hunting, I know you mentioned big game, all that. Why don't you just take us through your journey a little bit? Um, you know, did you grow up hunting as a kid? Was that part of your family? Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of how'd that all come about so for you? My old man was, uh, he hunted anything that moved. And I think it's a kind of a throwback of his dad hunted anything that moved, uh, big turkey hunters, uh, big, big game hunters. My old man on his own, when archery kind of came into vogue in the in the 80s, which is when I was born, fell in love with archery and ran an archery shop out of the small town that I grew up in. And so I just grew up in that culture. But at the same point in time, big game seasons are only, you know, so long and that kind of a thing. I get asked all the time, what's one piece of gear you would never hunt without? Well, that is easy. It's Onyx Hunt. Onyx Hunt is the number one digital mapping software in the world. I've been using it for several years and it makes hunting uh, private and public land incredibly easy. Right at your fingertips, get so much information and data that you can pull up on the road hunting. Uh, not to mention, this is an app on your phone or your iPad, but they just released an uh, Apple CarPlay version. So if you have Apple CarPlay in your vehicle, plug in your phone and get all your pins and data with Onyx right on your vehicle's display. Super sweet. Check out onyxhunt.com. Use promo code ROOKIE20. Save you 20% on your Onyx membership today. Thing. And so we did a ton of small game hunting in between all that and even when we're bow hunting uh like january in arizona especially you can hunt over the counter deer javelina it's the best month for hunting our quail um waterfowl are still on the menu so it was everything was just kind of a combination hunt you'd be driving along to go glass for deer and there'd be a pond there with you know some pintails on it we go jump the pond and shoot a few pintails and all that good stuff but i remember even before i could hunt he, him taking me quail hunting a lot and that was one of his passions he he liked he liked eating quail, so therefore you got to go shoot some quail. And um, the very, I guess, more of a utilitarian mindset than than we're probably used to. Like that's food running on the ground, and so sure. it was a, probably a little different mindset as far as like my old man was all about numbers, that kind of a thing, which has slowly shifted. Like that's not my thing at all, sure. just because I don't need them. I know where they sell chicken and all that good stuff. I just really enjoy the pursuit. And so we always had a little bit of friction with that. Like when I got a little bit older, I'm like, I don't care if they win. That's fine. I'm going back. <laughs> sure. And his, you know, value as a human being was limits, that kind of a thing. But um, mm-hmm. I remember he took like, like Like that was success. Yeah, in yeah, his yeah. Eye. It was, I, I yeah, think yeah, it's a yeah. generational thing largely uh, sure. because that was his value to his dad was, oh, how'd you get a limit? You know, well, if it's good, you should have sure. got a limit, even when we were fishing and everything like that. And uh, I just never have been about that. I've just always enjoyed wearing a smile more than than counting birds or counting fish or that kind of a thing. But very, very good hunter, very, very good mentor. Uh, Anything triggered, he could shoot better than anybody I know. Terrific rifle shot, competed in um, trap and pistol silhouettes and all that good stuff. So it was, and then, like I said, at a relatively high level of archery, growing up in an archery shop, um, I just was really fortunate to have that kind of a mentor growing up because anything that you could think of in hunting or fishing, he could do better than you. So, and he was always willing to show you like, don't get me wrong. He'd thump you for 30 minutes while we were fishing and then show you what he was doing. And then you could, do, <laughs> you know, but very, very good, uh, upbringing that way. I remember he took me on my first quail 
the, the first quail that I shot, he just threw the 410 and we used to do everything kind of off of a four wheeler and we had a utility rack on the back and we put dog box on that. And I remember a gamble's quail sitting in a hackberry tree and he guided me over and guided me to it. And I, I tree pounded the crap out of that quail. And what was <laughs> odd about that is, uh, I remember he shook my hand on that one. It wasn't like a loving embrace or anything like that. It was like, Hey, welcome. You're going to be doing this forever. Kind of a, huh. nothing was said, wow. but he shook my hand and he congratulated me. And that was that and off to the sure. races. And a couple of years after that, I was six when that happened. And a couple of years after that, I got a 870 youth model and uh 20 gauge and then off to the races before school, after school, chasing quail, okay. chasing doves. Um, the laws were a little bit looser in that time. So like I, I could get off the school bus when I was 13, grab the four wheeler, throw the dogs on the, on the dog box and go hunt quail till dark. And I, I lived on the wow. edge of town. So everything was wide open from that. So I would lift off the school sure. bus, grab the dogs and go bird hunt and tell dark. And the rule wow. was only you'd be home at dark, you know? And so, yeah, <laughs> that was, that, that yeah, was the only that rule. Was and, and, uh, <laughs> Ran into why we were out deer hunting one day. We ran into uh, Dave Walker out of Idaho. He used to run a big, big Arizona camp, and he's kind of a legend in the Brittany world, at least the old school Brittany world. Um, trained under Bill Miller and all that stuff, and just hmm. some really, really nice field trial champions. And he gave me a Brittany, just gave me a Brittany. I mean, he had oh, a wow. giant string of dogs oh, out gosh. there, and we went out and visited him a couple times and BS with him because you know when you run into another hunter, it just turns into a three hour BS session and that kind of a deal. And him and Dad. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're, and then they're yeah, your best friend stories back and forth and everything like that. And then next thing you know, I'm hauling a Brittany home, uh, like a year and a half old Brittany. And that was kind of the start of my dogs. We always had dogs. Uh, like my dad had, um, short hairs and labs. My brother had a short hair and that was our first Brittany. And then I had Brittany's for a few years and then got a few more short hairs. And by the time I, I graduated high school and college and started working on a career and everything, I didn't have any dogs and it was probably best trying to build a career and, um, uh, move out on my own and kind of get my feet underneath me. But as soon as I had the opportunity again, and I could start seeing some windows of time that I wasn't doing anything, it was like, it's, it's time to get a dog again. And I ended up in like the worst sure. lab in history, but he, he still <laughs> did his job. He would, he would, you know, he would do some retrieving work if you needed him to, but it was kind of the start back into that for me, which was good. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so with that, so with that start back into it for you, it was kind of time to then get your kind of your own, your own dog and, and kind of move forward. Um, what, what led you to the lab at that point? Cause it sounds like you had, a, had some experience, right? With, with Brittany short hairs. We'd prior. always had lab. So what, so what was the lab pickup the, the, there? The main dog of like my childhood was a, a big yellow lab who was just stellar. And then, um, dog that carried over yeah. even when i was younger we had a black lab and she was really really good and um so like when i was i don't know maybe 23 or so i was like yeah it's time to get a lab again and i want a chocolate one this time and he was just the worst dog ever um just separation anxiety and all the bad stuff that you don't want but at the same point in time he was my little buddy i had him for 14 years just put him sure. down last june and uh he was, he was okay. my buddy for 14 years, and regardless of how much of a dirtbag he was, I matched him with dirtbaggishness on the other side. My little one. <laughs> and then um, there was a time there where after about 2000, Arizona quail hunting wasn't very good at all. I still did it um, mm. because it's, it's the only thing I know to do. Go, go, go whack a few quail here and there, and I feel like eating some quail. Let's go get some. But I had a buddy move into town. Uh, who was into bird dogs and uh, had a really nice uh, rawhide clown short hair. And then uh, about that time, uh, this is probably about 2014, 2015, um, Gun Dog Magazine came out with like a Brock Francais feature. And uh, he was already looking at him. And I saw that feature too. And we kind of both came together and we're like, well, have you ever even heard of these things? They look like short hairs, but like smaller, I don't know. Oh, hold on. My mind just exploded. So you're not talking about a Brock Italiano, Brock right? Brock Francais. Brock Francais. Okay. I heard when you, when you said Brock earlier, I was, that's where my no, mind no, no, went for some Francais, reason. I understand those puddly pasta dogs, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we kind of got to looking at it and then he, he jumped on and like didn't even bat an eye and bought one and it showed up and it was one of the neatest, most natural pointing dogs I've ever seen. Super Super wow. user friendly. You kind of teach them their name, stab them in birds, and that's it. 
And then what was even crazier wow. is when you brought them home, they went to sleep. I was like, what the <laughs> hell is this? Having short hairs, you know, the majority of the bird dogs in my life were short hairs um, with a few Brits mixed in that were, that were nice. But I was like, man, I've never even seen this kind of behavior out of a six month old dog. And we're shooting wild sure. birds off of this dog at six months and it's coming home and sleeping and it, you got to wake him up in the morning at 8 a.m. And I was like, man, you got to get me some of that. So I found a local breeder. Ended up with a really nice one. That was the one that ended up with uh, globoid cell leukodystrophy, or unfortunately. But really, really nice local breeder. They supported uh, supported me through that whole process and even got me a replacement dog. And that's the old that's the old oh, dog wow. you guys see uh, on my Instagram. Okay. She was replacement dog, so the best free dog ever. But um, wow. she's so so so. Talk about yeah. those Brocks a little more. So are they kind of like a. a more chill short hair so if I had to, more if trainable I had to, or what, what are they yes like and no they're they're very very soft very very soft and biddable kind of like a Brittany or maybe even a french brit um they don't take a lot of pressure but they kind of don't need a lot in my experience so um hmm. they're smaller t- they tend to be smaller than short hairs uh, like opal's about 38 pounds at hunting weight you know her fat off season weights maybe about 40 42 pounds that kind of a thing and it's just so damn hot here in the summertime, it's hard to keep them running. Uh, so sure. uh, we do have a down season where I'm not doing much with them. They they just work their hind parts off all yeah. winter. We're going to rest them for a couple months, and then I'll start doing my work up in about August. But back to the Brocks, um, they just kind of, they're smaller. They're a little bit leggier. They seem to have, just visually to me, a little bit deeper chest. And if you read about like the Pyrenees region yeah. between France and Spain, it's a lot like the stuff I hunt in here. So it's rocky, can be kind of warm into the 90s, that kind of a deal. And so they're kind of a, a dog built over there that fits really well in the country that I have here. And so they have the nice short coat like a short hair. They look like a short hair to people, to most people. Everybody says nice short hair. And I just kind of nod and move on with my day. So I just don't feel like that guy that explains oh, thanks. them. Um, but they... they their feet hold up really well because they're kind of smaller and lighter. And in this, this country okay. eats dogs feet for a living. And I just don't have to mm. worry about her feet. I can hunt her. Like when we go to, wow. you know, pheasant hunts or something like that in the Midwest, I can run her hard 35 to 40 miles a day and her feet are fine because that's the nicest ground she's ever seen ever. Everything here is volcanic. rock. Pairs your feet up and there's <laughs> a lot of up and down. Um, I will say that they have an odd gait to them. So it's not like an all out lope or run like a pointer or anything like that. It's okay. Uh, horse people would know this, um, better than I would, but it's just kind of a camber. She just kind of cambers along and it's a weird pace at about seven, okay. eight miles an hour or something like that. If you're onto the Garmin, but she can do wow. seven or eight mile an hour okay. pace for five days straight. Where is for a like, long time, like yeah. a super flashy setter or pointer. They're going to lean on 12, 13 miles an hour. And by noon, they're shot. They're done. And so okay. she's, I, I just kind of refer to her as my little metronome dog. She just kind of, you know, just <laughs> does her th- And how, uh, how far out are these dogs ranging? Are, are well, they a little it, more it mid-range? It depends on the cover. So, D- like, uh, yeah, I would call it a mid-range. Um, I, I don't see any need to have a pointing dog that only hunts about 40 yards. Uh, if that's the case, I'll just run the flusher. Um, but Opal's average range and kind of our broken hilly oak savanna on Mearns country is about 80 to 120 yards. If I are in a wide open okay. scaly country, you know, nice big flats, that kind of thing. She'll lean out to about 200 yards, something like that. If it gets thicker, okay. she'll okay, pull nice. into, you know, maybe that 60 or 80 yards kind of a deal. And she adjusts really well on her own. Okay. I don't, and I'm not a big fan of talking to her. Um, I don't like talking to my dogs, that kind of stuff. She just uh, adjusts sure. to the cover and, um, if we're not finding birds, walk more and slow down. So hmm. and she'll, she kind of does do her thing. thing. It's, it's, she's about the, the most, uh, Ronco showtime oven you can imagine. You just kind of say, get it. <laughs> kind of a- wow. That's awesome, man. Uh, yeah. I, I don't even know. And again, if I've seen one, it might've, I might've yeah, thought it was so, a short hair. So you know, uh, yeah, I'd love to see one of those. kind of got that little someday. dish nose on them, like a grizzly bear. Brock's have got sure. the same thing. So if you see kind of a dainty little short hair, that's leggy got a deep chest okay. and they got that stupid little dish nose on them that's that that's uh, probably okay probably. yeah i'll be looking i'll be looking for that better, i take her to the damn vet and they're like oh i had nice short hair and i'm like ah oh, yeah all right whatever yeah. 
Whatever, whatever. That's what let it go. <laughs> let it go. Dog, though. That's, that's the price you pay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, t- 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 mostly because I'm I'm curious. Uh, talk a little bit about your. And now you don't have Brits anymore, right? But you said you ran Brits yeah, yeah, in a while the, back, uh, late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, okay. Were those to you? Were those, those yeah. pretty good dogs that you're running? I think, in, I or? think with anything else, um, or, there's a bajillion breeds out there, and uh, I had really good experiences with my Brits. Um, even the one that had uh, epilepsy, uh, it'd make him you know a couple times a year. But yeah. other than that, he was just a hunting phenom. Uh, I think he was a lot of dog for me at the time because he came out of trial lines, Dave Walker's trial line, hmm. and uh, for okay. like a 13 year old kid, that's a lot of damn dog. Oh geez, um, <laughs> I forgot. Yeah, yeah. Forgot how young so you were I was, then? I was Jeez. Just a kid, and it was a lot of dog. But um, I've I've never had a heartache with any of them. Like some of the nicest dogs I consistently hunt over that buddies have are uh, are Brits. Uh, like I said, my buddy Eric has got just an absolute phenom of a Brit named Dexter, and I don't know any of his sure. lines or anything like that. I just know he's a damn killer. And he's kind of a weird little <laughs> plot along dog too. He just kind of picks his way along, and then the next thing you know, you your everybody's Garmin's going off. Well, Dexter point somewhere and you don't even know when it happened he just kind of does a ninja vanish and then he's got birds somewhere but yeah great great (laughs) dogs uh i'm not in love with the coat on them if i had one gripe it would be the coat uh in dealing with burrs and and stick ups and stuff like that but it's the same with the setter and it's the same with the cocker you just kind of come up with a system to deal with them but they seem to do well brits are super popular down here in arizona if you're running pointing dogs it's short hairs or brits one of the two and uh they're super, super popular okay. down here. There's some really, really nice lines coming out of this part of the world that I'm not super familiar with, but I know that when people shoot them, birds die. Sure. Um, I, think, I think the big takeaway yeah. in making fun of every breed, as I've kind of made a, a passion of doing, is if if somebody's new and coming into this, does mom do what I want on the bird I want in the country I hunt in, and does dad do what I want on the bird I want in the country I hunt in? Odds are... If that lines up, uh, regardless of whatever the the pedigree says the hell it is, it's probably going to do what you want, you know? So, sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> got a little my, history behind it and yeah, got some, some proving grounds. Of... Behind it is, um, try to try to find something that's doing what you what you like. And then odds are that that litter is probably going to do something like that. A big believer in you don't pick puppies, you pick litters. And um, sure. Like when I, when I got Luke, fortunately, um, Robert Jones turned me on to that litter and, and Paul over there at Alder Fork, but Paul had been coming down here in winters for years and his dogs are just absolutely hammering Mern's quail. And I was like, well, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. What kind of distance are they hunting? We start, starts that conversation of, okay, what are we looking for? Cause I'm sure. looking to throw a bigger net here. Well, okay. Maybe, maybe this is a good fit for you then. And kind of how we went around that but yeah they did it on my ground on my bird and uh, mm. yeah so that kind of checked kinda, your box there deal where, who do i send the check to you know and was that your first yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, first, your set. first setter yeah. you, or, okay so i'm kind of uh, okay. dabbling That's i don't awesome. i don't know we none of us know how many how many laps we get around on this on this rock so uh there's just a lot of stuff out there i want to see and so like i've been kind of just this Know, the cocker yeah. and well it started with the brocks actually kind of like i don't know what the hell they are let's try that for a while and i really like them and then the cocker is a lot of fun i, I like your attitude it's kind of like yeah let's, let's try yeah. it it's and different. um i mean they all it, once again if you get get them from the right people they all do awesome stuff like as hard as i pick on draughts uh before i was looking at brocks i was looking at draughts and was really thinking about a draught quite and, uh, okay. because at the time I was like, okay, this is going to be a one dog household, which is not how it ended up being, but this is going to be a one dog household. Let's, let's go get that Swiss army knife dog and maybe do a lot of things with that one dog. And, um, kind of ran into a sure. few roadblocks here and there were some drop breeders of like, um, and I understand why they do it and I approve of why they do it. But like, Hey, if you get a puppy from us, we're going to want them tested at this date and at this date and this date. And I'm like, I'm cutting you a check and buying a puppy. I'll be damned if you're going to tell me what I'm going to do with that puppy because I'm a little feral in nature. And like <laughs> if you went and bought a car and they said, okay, we we're going to mandate that you do this, this, and this. We're gonna, you're going to put this on this part of the windshield and that kind of a deal. You, you tell them go to hell. 
So I just kind of apply that to the life, kind of a little feral. And so I was just like, ah, it's just not for me right now, you know, but it. Yeah, yeah. grew up a lot of, a lot of folks around me that had, had some really nice wire hairs. Um, and I've seen some wire hairs do some really, really nice okay. work in this part of the world. Are they, are they, are they pretty common? Are they pretty common There's, in Arizona just because of coat and heat and all that so, or not really? When I was a kid, there were short hairs and wire hairs everywhere and we're starting to see it come back, but it's just with the resurgence of quail. Mm -hmm. So when quail numbers dove off in Arizona in the late nineties, early two thousands, bird dogs did too. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people I know just like, you know, their dog yeah. aged out and they never re upped that kind of a thing. But with the resurgence of Southwest quail, um, you're starting to see a lot more stuff again. You're starting to see everything, you know, and whether they're okay. visiting or they're locals or whatever, like there's a guy, 30 minutes away from me who runs a really nice poodle pointer kennel. I didn't even know what the hell that was 10 years ago. You know what I mean? Mm. So yeah, you're just <laughs> starting to see some stuff. Up, but it, That's it's cool. Driven, That's it's cool. driven by different birds. Breeds. It's absolutely driven by birds. If we've got birds, oh, absolutely. we're getting stuff. I mean, I still don't know what the hell a Brock is, sure. but you know, I'm bringing one here and maybe a few people seeing them <laughs> here and there. And people are like, Oh, that's a Brock. Okay, cool. And they never would. 20 years ago, you know, it's sure, sure. driven by quail. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one more thing kind of, uh, while we're talking about dogs here, um, as far as the training side goes, are you using, uh, are you having someone train your dogs like a, like a pro? Are you training your dogs? If so, are you just kind of figuring this out on your own? Like, like talk a little on the train side for your, uh, yeah. for your dogs and so the answer what that's yes. been like. Um, so growing up, uh, we had a pigeon loft and we, we did it all on our own. And, um, when I got that Brittany from Dave Walker, he had a VHS at the time called meat on the table. And for $60, you could get that VHS. And a lot of it's like the Gibbons West method that we know now, but this is, you know, infancy stage of Gibbons okay. West stuff. And, uh, yeah, VHS and you could get a 12 foot check cord. And what we're knowing as, as a pinch collar, now that leather collar with the studs on the inside, flat. That was cutting edge oh, yeah. stuff in 1990. Yep, yep. So, and, uh, <laughs> so I got that kind of used that for some bird dogs for a few years. And then when I kind of got back into the pointing dogs, uh, YouTube was a thing by this point. And so just kind of mm -hmm. dabbling on some stuff here and there, still kind of sticking with like some Gibbons West stuff and doing it on my own. Uh, but being a big believer in, okay. and the best teacher out there is birds. And I still believe that like, uh, if you teach a mm -hmm. dog their name and you shove them in birds, and you reward the behaviors you want, like don't shoot knocked birds, that kind of a thing, that they kind of kind of catch on on their own. But I've never taken a dog from like sure. steady to wing shot and fall because I'm, I'm it's just never been an interest of mine. Wanting to do it now just to gain the experience of doing it. Now, I bought the setter for a couple of couple of reasons. I wanted to uh, throw a bigger net, have a little bit more horsepower for a uh, bigger country. Um, like I'm wanting to start dabbling in some of the prairie states. And if you walk 60 yards, the wrong side of a bird with a tight running dog, you don't find those birds. So wanting to throw a little bit bigger of a net and wanting to challenge myself as, as a trainer and, and maybe deal with something a little bit harder headed. Um, because all of my dogs have been pretty darn biddable and wanting to grow, uh, as a handler. And with that, there was some, a little bit of learning curve here and there, uh, nothing bad and nothing nothing to his detriment at all. Um, but some weird little hangups here and there. And there's a phenomenal local trainer, um, by the name of Guy Mollicone, Mollicone Kennels. And, um, uh, he, he helped me out a little bit with, uh, Luke here and there on some stuff. And more than anything, he just had, because he's a full-time pro trainer and I don't have a pigeon loft anymore. He had access to birds and he has access to, you know, 20 years of that knowledge of putting his hands on thousands of dogs and something that blew my mind in, cause I've never worked with a pro trainer in my life. Um, and watching him as I come out and, you know, help him and hammer stakes and plant birds and shoot birds for him and that kind of stuff. So he could handle dogs, a pro trainer, the quality sure. of product you get from them. I was never a believer in until I saw they've had their hands on so many dogs and they have to have a, a commercially replicatable system and the timeline that they get stuff done in mm. is unfathomable to a guy who trains his dogs. So like uh, mm. watching him will break out a dog. <laughs> sure. It's like, holy crap. I just watched that happen in my, in front of my eyes instead of this like 
month and a half, two month long <laughs> process of, you know, that kind of a deal. And I'm like, holy crap, I just watched that happen right now. And it's, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. So with that, um, I'm going to start and keep, kind of keep, keep that relationship open and keep working with that guy. He is just unreal and just kind of a dog whisperer when it comes to that kind of a thing. And I just want to kind of, uh, apprentice under, under that kind of a, kind of a system and just get as much as I can. Cause I'm, I'm kind of sick with yeah. it in the sense of, I just love it. You get a lot of dog. Sure. And when you see it, like like you you said, like when you see it firsthand, it, it also kind of clicks more too. Because I can watch even a video on YouTube. I can watch videos. I can read till nauseum on yeah. whatever, will breaking, force fetch, whatever it is. But until you, yeah, really see someone well, who's just, really, really good at it, kind of live in person, and you can ask questions, like, it, it kind of like, changes um, the game a little like, bit. Uh, we're talking clicker training for marking good behavior, right? Well... We were we were doing some some stuff like sure. that on on a, on a woe board, and he's marking good behavior with a, a word or something like that. He's also marking negative behavior, like when they would step off. And I'm like, why didn't I ever think of that? I've always marked the good side, but I never marked the negative side. So used to lifting a dog back up and hmm. putting him back, that kind of a deal. And he would just ah, 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 ah. and because he's marking both sides of behavior, the hmm. time frame gets literally cut in half, cut in half, mind blowing. I was like, wow. I've been doing it my whole life and I have never seen wow. that. He's marking good behavior. And marking <laughs> yeah, I don't, and I don't think I've heard that before either. Blowing. But yeah, the name's Guy Mollicone, My Mollicone Kennels. He is just the nicest person ever and just a fountain of knowledge. If you're just hanging out with him, you know, putting birds in a bag or whatever, there's just just gems falling out of the sky all the time. You're like, oh, oh. Yeah, just left yeah, and right. And he, you're like, oh, can you repeat under, that uh, West as well. So like that whole West method, I mean, it's, it's, okay. it's strong in this part of the world. So, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned That's book. Cool. That's cool. A book that um, is always influential to me was, the. Again? I think it's something along the lines of uh, teaching dogs to teach themselves. If you Amazon that, you can find that book too. But that, every time I get a puppy, I reread that okay. book and uh, kind of a good family. Okay. What do you, what do you uh, think teaching it's, bird what dogs do you think it's how called to again? teach themselves, something like that. Well, that is a wrap of part one with Robert. Uh, make sure you come back for part two. I'll drop that in a few days from now. Sorry to leave you uh, kind of in the middle of that, but uh, definitely a lengthy conversation that would break up into two parts. So, hey guys, uh, just a reminder, if you have not left a rating and review, I have a lot of new listeners over the last several months. Um, if you have just started listening to the podcast and are enjoying it, uh, would you do me a huge, huge favor and head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and drop a rating and review. Um, I love seeing the written reviews, love um, learning what the show's impact is having on people out there who are actually listening. I love reading those. Um, gives me kind of a pulse on, on how the show's doing, what you want more of, what you want less of, um, how the show is, uh, again, helping inspire you in some way or another. So head over there, leave a rating and review would be very, very helpful. Um, also check out the YouTube channel. Uh, I've been dropping uh, podcast episodes over at YouTube as well. So I know some of you just love uh, consuming your content on the YouTube platform, which is awesome. So I have start, started uploading all podcast episode over at youtube.com. If you haven't heard of it, well, we probably have some other things to talk about. <laughs> uh, hey guys, until next week, go put some miles on those boots follow your favorite bird dog. Stay tuned. Part two is coming up in a few days.